So this lecture introduces Gopher codes, which are the codes that Macaulay suggested in his original paper, introducing code-based cryptography, and these are also still the codes that we use today for the most confidence-inspiring um, code-based cryptography systems. So we have seen how to introduce codes using the generator matrix or parity check matrix, but for Gopher codes, the following representation is more natural. So we're specifying a finite field f2 to the m. So you can define this over other fields, but we're just going to look at binary Gopher codes. And so everything is going to be based over f2. And then we might consider, well, we do consider some extension f2 to the m. And we're picking a subset of the field elements of f2 to the m. So this is an ordered list. Um, we call this a support. So n is upper bounded by 2 to the m, but it can be smaller. And note that you have lots of possibilities of how to arrange those n elements that you pick. So first of all, there's a choice of n elements. And secondly, um, the order of those element, elements. So you have n factorial um, choices of different orders there. You're also picking a square-free polynomial over this field. So over this f2 to the m and, well, some degree t. We typically want to choose it irreducible, but square free is really what matters for the properties we're going to look at next. And this polynomial is called the Gopher polynomial, and it relates to this support that we have just seen. So this uh, list of the AI, so A1 to AN, um, we require that the AIs are not roots. So if G is irreducible over that field, well, <laughs> first of all, definitely it doesn't have any roots. And so that's why the irreducible choice is, is very convenient there. Well, and here's the code. This set here, this is the set of valid code words. So the binary Gopher code is typically denoted by gamma of the support and the Gopher polynomial, so gamma of L, G, is given by the set of, and now note, this is F2. So this is not F2 to the M. So the um, entries of the code word C are just zeros or ones. And it's such that if you take CI divided by X minus AI, that that is zero congruent to g of x. Now I've been saying polynomial there, so s of c is a polynomial, because the um, ai's are not roots of g, so we can invert them, or we can invert x minus ai modulo g of x. However, that would be a long uh, polynomial of degree t minus 1, typically, and so it wouldn't fit on the slide, whereas this is a nice short compact representation. Now, I claim that this is a code. Well, let's first see that this is a linear subspace, that it's linear. You can see, well, if you're taking two code words, C and B, and so both of them satisfy that this gives zero mod G of X, then, of course, also there's some this G of X. The length is also easy to see, so it's just length N. That's the N we're putting in there by the length of the support. But then the minimum distance and the dimension are less obvious. In this talk, I'll show you the dimension. In the next talk, we're going to cover the minimum distance. All right, so how can we estimate the minimum distance? That's how can we estimate the dimension? So one thing we noticed, and I already mentioned this to say that, well, this S of C is actually a polynomial in X, is that we can invert X minus AI. We can compute the GCD using extended GCD, and so we're getting this long polynomial FI. And so fi is the inverse of x minus ai. So what we're actually having there in this s of c, that being 0 mod c of a, g of x, uh, we can also write as a polynomial equation, so replacing the 1 over x minus ai by this fi of x, and then putting in all the coefficients. Now these fi having coefficients fij, those coefficients live over the big field. So those live over f2 to the m. The CIs live over F2, but the definition, the AIs live over F2 to the M, and so accordingly also the FIJ are field elements from the larger field. So we're having these T equations there. So we have T different powers of X, each of which has to be zero individually. So the sum from 1 till N of the CI FIJ has to be zero, so that's just sorting by the powers of x to the j. However, each of those is actually m conditions over the base field. So we're having 
T conditions over F2 to the M, and that turns into Tn conditions over F2. So then we're also sorting by a basis of F2 to the M over F, uh, F2, so that's dimension M over one another. So we have a basis uh, with M elements, and so that's where this extra factor of M comes from. Okay, so that means we have T times M conditions over F2, and well, when you think about the parity check matrix, that's exactly how we define our parity check matrix. So they are Tm conditions, each of which involve n variables. So the dimensions of this parity check matrix would be height T times n, uh, m, and width n. Now, just looking at this, we don't know whether this is possibly redundant. So there might be some of those rows that are linear, uh, linear dependent. So we only get a lower bound on the dimension. The dimension might be high, but it cannot be uh, worse than n minus t times n, because that's what the, the dimension is. Remember that the parity check matrix has um, n minus k rows. So if you flip things over, then k is n minus t times m. And as I said, the dimension might be larger. So some of those rows might actually be linearly dependent. I promised you a nice view of the parity check matrix. So if we write it out, so now going back again to the expression of the ci divided by x minus ai, then we can justify this view here. So the gi's come in from the extended Euclidean algorithm and the g of ai as well. And then, well, we have a fundamental matrix in the middle. Okay, so this would be the nice parity check matrix. But if you want to use a code in a code-based crypto system, let's think about the Niederreiter system there, then actually we want to hide the nice code. So this is just a copy of the old slide that we have, where I was talking about how we take this nice parity check matrix A, H, and left and right multiply by this S and P, where P was a permutation matrix and S was a general invertible matrix. So there was a n minus k invertible matrix S, which, well, scrambles this matrix, and there is a n by n permutation matrix P. Now, for GOPA codes in particular, let's see how those are represented. Well, we have just seen how they're represented, but let's see what those things do. So one thing is, well, our secrets, we need to keep this GOPA polynomial G and also the support L secret. So let's start with our private key. It's the bottom row there is the GOPA polynomial and the support. Now, what a permutation matrix would be doing is just flip around the ordering of these AIs. So since we already can pick any of these permutations in the key generation phase, we don't actually need to use an extra permutation matrix P. That would be just reordering at another time. And since, well, it is already something which is not known to the attacker, we can skip this P. So the order of these elements in L is part of the secret and we have to keep that, well, to ourselves. And then I had motivated the use of the systematic form as something which saves, um, saves storage or well, bandwidth when you have to transmit it. So systematic form means we're bringing it to the form where we have um, some k, k prime and then we have an identity matrix next to it. And well, the identity matrix is an n minus k times n minus k matrix. And that one we don't have to send or store because we know it's just an identity matrix. So we only have to send this n minus k times k matrix, k prime there. Um, but let's look into what this actually does. So if you think about how matrix multiplication works, um, if we first would apply some S and then bring it to systematic form, we're basically applying two different versions of S. Well, we first bring it to some K something, well, from H to K, and then applying the systematic form, so doing Gaussian elimination, is another matrix multiplication. So we can just combine those two into one matrix S. So the, uh, the fact that we want to bring it to systematic form just means this implicitly applies this um, matrix S. So we can skip the P by remembering the ordering of the support elements, and we can skip the S by remembering um, 
well, by just choosing the systematic form there. Now, normally we would need to remember S, so remember how which operations we're doing um, for doing the systematic form. So going from the K that we're getting, or from the H that we got, to the K that we need to get. However, um, the decoding algorithm, which is in the next video, does not actually use the parity check matrix H, so we don't actually need to remember how this S works. So the decoding algorithm would only use G and L, and so we actually have the private key just being these two polynomials, and the public key uh, just being this K prime part. So that's also a lot nicer than what we maybe had thought we would need. So it's still pretty large. I mean, a N minus K by K matrix for something secure can easily be a megabyte, at least for very high security, but still that's not as bad as having basically twice as long for also having the identity matrix. And the private key part is really, really small. If you want to make it even smaller, we could say, well, we pick a random seed and then generate the support by running a hash function over it or something. So we can compress the private key part for, to a very small number if we're willing to um, spend on recomputing it each time. Most of the time, we're just happy with having G and L there.